We've been researching the way that the international community finance emergency preparedness. In particular, we've looked at the Sudan, Niger, Myanmar, Philippines, Haiti. And what we found is that the international financing architecture for preparedness, it's unnecessarily complicated. The system that we've got at the moment is simply not fit for purpose. The ideal scenario is that you have a sustainable national system of preparedness that's functioning and the international community should step in only when that national capacity has been surpassed or in very particular contexts such as in conflict. Unfortunately at the moment what you have is a situation where the international funding mechanisms are not necessarily reinforcing that national system of preparedness but instead they're reinforcing quite a project-led and piecemeal approach to how we do emergency preparedness. When I was working in South Sudan uh, for the UN, we received a call from the county commissioner uh, um, for, of Raja County, which was not too far from us, and he basically said, they've arrived. And he told us that uh, a thousand uh, displaced people had arrived from South Sudan, and more were on their way. Firstly, we didn't have adequate communications uh, or an adequate communication system with our colleagues to the north in South Darfur. Secondly, uh, and very much connected to this, we didn't have early warning. So we didn't know that a population uh, had been forced out of their homes six weeks before and that population was heading south. And thirdly, and this is that we hadn't actually done a proper risk analysis. We had a population increase, an unforeseen population increase of 2,000 people to an already vulnerable part of the state. And this immediately had consequences. Uh, the consequences were that the resources that we had provided for this population were very quickly used up. The resources that were already existing in the community that were used up. And this led to tensions and some insecurity. Imagine we had adequate early warning. We had communication from our colleagues across the border in South Darfur. We had put contingency planning in place and we had resources in place. And of course, all of this depends on having a, an adequate analysis of risk. We didn't really have all of these things. We did what we could. Um, but uh, in hindsight, it would be great to go back and maybe to have all of that in place. Well, preparedness is a lot more complex than it seems. So when we say preparedness, we mean preparedness at national level, preparedness for international organizations, for international NGOs, but we also mean preparedness for local governments, for local organizations, and for communities. So all this level of complexity that needs to be reflected in preparedness work and well-funded at all different levels. So with our disaster risk reduction program, we manage communities to have a, a stock of food in their cereal bank. So the moment of crisis, they could distribute a small amounts of food to all the people most vulnerable. Because it's very important that they need to have a stock just right there. It's a lot cheaper also that to move a stock from abroad or from the capital into these communities in isolated places. Preparedness has been always placed in the emergency side of work. However, Mainly in emergencies where they are recurring, where they are happening year after year, it's very important to keep an eye on the long term. So it's important that preparedness is placed with development work as well as with emergency. In Mozambique, where we've been working for several decades responding to emergencies, it's traditionally been quite difficult to get funding for preparedness activities. However, following the 2013 flooding, we had an inundation of funding for projects of six to eight months for humanitarian response. Moving forward, we've just received funding for a three-year project which looks at both preparedness and response. This means that we can work as a consortium to capacity build local partners and the government. We can pre-position stocks in terms of essential items. We can train teams ahead of time in order to make sure that if a cyclone or flooding does happen, we can quickly intervene and ensure that communities are met with an effective response which is both timely and at appropriate scale. Flexible funding allows us to both prepare ahead of an emergency and also switch the aim of that funding to response activities as needed. In my experience, I believe preparedness really falls uh, into both humanitarian and development. The funding for preparedness is really, in my opinion, not adequate. Uh, using our example of Sahel country work, so we have received £800,000 for four countries in our Sahel appeal. But it sounds a lot, but when it comes to the individual, it worked out uh, five pounds per beneficiary. They are facing both slow onset disasters and quick onset disasters. Um, 
This is to say we need to take a multi-strand approach to deal with these different kind of disasters, sometimes simultaneously. So not just look at the hardware like uh, a food bank a distribution and give out seeds, but also the software, the training, how to uh, teach them better agricultural knowledge, how to teach them better organize themselves in the time of disaster. So all these have to go hand in hand because they don't live in a compartmentalized life as humanitarian or development. They live a whole life. This is how they respond to whatever events come their way. The donors have a major role to play in breaking down this artificial construct and they can do this by providing funding streams that incentivize both development and humanitarian actors to come together. But what the donors need to do by the same token is reorganize themselves. They need to work more holistically, more coherently, and as a result, they will become more effective as funders. Preparedness struggles to find funding because donors like to measure impact. And it's very difficult to measure the impact of something that hasn't actually happened. However, there has been a shift. The donors have become more accepting of the less traditional methodologies under which they can gather evidence. And by using these to build up a body of evidence, it's provided them with greater legitimacy with which they can then go on to fund those preparedness activities that are so difficult to measure. Donors have been given a gift in this notion of resilience. It's a concept that donors, development actors and humanitarian actors all understand because essentially less vulnerable, more prepared communities are more resilient communities. There's a number of opportunities that we've got, particularly in the run-up to the post-2015 development agenda, to really rethink the way that we're financing emergency preparedness. So for example, there's a few things that we can do. We can either just try and tweak the existing system and make it the best that it can be within the constraints of that system, or we can ask some really difficult fundamental questions and try and redress the system and transform it for the better. At the moment, the business as usual scenario is that funding for preparedness comes as only part of a response. We really need to ask some tough questions and try and transform that to really think about what system is best and what system is going to be fit for purpose.